Hello, good morning everyone. This is Shankari Zoo, educator of Arundhati Anna Zoological Park, welcomes you for the Species Ambassador Program. This is a first of its kind initiative initiated by Arundhati Anna Zoological Park to the towards the conservation of species. So currently we are in our first series of Species Ambassador Program, and the species in focus was slender loris. So uh, before going into the actual program, we just wanted to describe what this the species ambassador program is all about. So uh, this is the first of its kind initiative, as I told earlier. This is initiated by an Indian zoo, and the session it will be it will be a two day program that is organized on the weekends. So the students from class six and above. or professionals adults or any wildlife aspirants can register in this program and participate and a first section was started yesterday with the inaugural address by the zoo director and welcoming note by our zoo deputy director sir nagar satish gidjala sir and yesterday we have our eminent speaker hn kumar sir senior scientist of sacred He has described about the various uh, facts distribution of this uh, few animals and the roles, and he has shared his experience in this uh, throughout this twenty-five years of research on this species. And today we have an, another eminent speaker, Smitha. Smitha, ma'am, will be presenting today's session. So uh, once completing these two sessions, uh, the participants will be titled as the species ambassador of slender loris. so during today's session we will be posting you an acknowledgement form okay like uh, you have completed these two session i request all the participant to fill up this form by today so for the participants who have filled this form today will be titled as a zoo, as a species ambassador of slender loris and they we will be providing them an e certificate with the title okay and after once you have been titled as species ambassador species ambassadors has to discharge their role uh, by promoting awareness about the species in focus so based on the awareness that you create based on the awareness program that you create we will be giving you a special badges um uh, special badges for you and what will be your role like your role uh, will be spreading the awareness about the species to the public and to your family and friends about the significance threats faced by this animal and what are the conservation measures that we can do as a citizen uh, by doing this program you have to build a strong supporting force on conservation of the species in focus and uh, you can you have to conduct awareness session to your known people to your family friends group either online or offline mode so uh, now we currently prefer you to conduct sessions online mode and uh, azp will be providing you a continuous support for you to conduct this awareness sessions by providing the experts suggestions and all and based on the number of uh, programs that you do we will be grading up with the badges as i told if you have come if you have did three sessions you will be uh, you will get a badge like a loris guard and if you do five sessions you will be provided with a badge like a loris savior and uh, if you do nine sessions we will be providing you a title as a loris a uh, guardian and if you are uh, doing a uh, 11 sessions you will be getting a title as a loris lover and if you are doing 15 sessions you will be provided with a title like loris conservator so this how the program goes um so uh, at end of this session today smita ma'am will also be explaining you uh, the role of the species ambassador what you have to do and what you, you are not supposed to do so all these things will be uh, told at end of the session so now i take privilege to welcome our uh, speaker of the day smita ma'am uh, smita ma'am uh, is working with uh, slender loris for over 8 years and uh, she is an uh, principal investigator and uh, uh, independent researcher uh, she begins her journey uh, by rescuing two baby slender loris at iis campus and uh, well she thought it was a baby uh, baby and it is too small to be a monkey 
On researching, she found that if they were not babies and they are fully grown adults. This uh, brings her an interest to know about this species more and that inspired her to go into the forest and learn about this uh, cute uh, little primate. So her research was much closed on Malabar slender loris, which is one of the least known primate of the world. And uh, Smita ma'am has studied about the various aspects of this species and uh, she, in today's session she will be talking more about it. Uh, and uh, she also did a research particularly on the behavior, ecology and threats faced by the slender loris in its natural habitat. And uh, I welcome Smita ma'am uh, to this program and now the session is over to you Smita ma'am. Good morning, everybody. I would like to begin by thanking uh, Wanderlu Zoo to give me this amazing opportunity to talk to you guys. Uh, I would like to thank Devashis Thana sir, Naga Satish sir, and Shankri ma'am for initiating this amazing and very important species ambassador program. I feel very humbled and um, exceptional to be part of this program. And a very big applause on creating the ebook on slender lotuses, which would I would say is one on one among the first slender lotus ebooks in India for the Indian slender lotuses. And hopefully, together the zoo and us experts would help in bringing up very good initiatives and uh, very strong ambassadors for the lotuses through this program. Okay, so I would like to start sharing my slides so that you guys go, don't get lost and all the words that are being said. Okay, so that's a slender loris. Okay. Um, I am Smita and I am a primatologist. Why do I call myself a primatologist? Because I study primates. What are these primates? What are primates? Primates are a group of animals or mammals who can rotate the hand completely over their shoulder joint, who have opposable fingers and toes, which help them grasp a lot of items, grasp the what, anything that they want to hold on to. They have a strong clavicle that helps them in the movement of the arms. They have nails and not claws, like you find in dogs and cats. So they have nails. And then they have a binocular vision and a very well-developed cerebrum. So a primate has to have all of these characteristics. Now, what are the animals that you find with all these characteristics? You are aware of the monkeys, the human beings, apes, but then are you aware of another group of animals that are not monkeys? So to begin with, let me tell you that the entire primate kingdom can be divided into three large groups. What are they? They are apes. Apes would be your chimpanzee, orangutan, gorilla, human beings, and then the monkeys, the monkeys that everyone are aware of, the monkeys that come and steal your food, the monkeys that pester you, the monkeys that look so cute, all the monkeys with tails come under the monkey category. But you have this special group called the prosimians. The prosimians are not monkeys, but then they're primates. What are they? So these prosimians were the first one to evolve far, far, far before, you know, in the Mesozoic period, many, many million years ago. So they were the first ones to come. So the lorises, the lemurs, they all came first. After that came all the monkeys and then the apes and then last the human beings. So we human beings have come on this planet, the, the you know, the, the recentest beings. We, we came just very recently compared to all these animals that have been living on this planet Earth far, far, far before we human beings came into the being. Where are all primates from? See, primates are not seen everywhere in the world because the primate cannot withstand very cold climate, nor can they withstand very dry, hot climate. So they are always in the temperate zone. Temperate zone is where you have not too uh, vast climate, you know, the climatic variation is very small and comfortable and they don't need blankets, nor do they need uh, ACs to survive. 
So such reason, regions only you find primates. Now, if you see this red portion, the red portion has only monkeys and nothing else. Whereas the green portions have apes, monkeys and uh, prosimians. Now, to give you an idea of what these prosimians are, the closest idea I could think of uh, was the cartoons. You know, the, all the cartoons that you watch, I was wondering which cartoon to relate you guys with. So have you seen King Julian? the lemurs of Madagascar. <laughs> King Julian is a ringtail lemur. And you have uh, Maurice by his side, which is an II. This is an II, okay? Here, this is an II. And you have uh, Mott. Mott is a goodsman mouse lemur. These are the closest relatives to the lorises, but they are not lorises, they are lemurs. So, uh, and these lemurs are found only in this yellow color island. You see this yellow island, that's Madagascar. They are not found anywhere else in the world. Why? Because they have become extinct everywhere else. Earlier, they were spread all across Africa. But then due to excess of hunting and killing and uh, due to various factors, all the lemurs in the mainland of Africa are extinct. Now they are just in one small pocket, which is Madagascar, which is an island. And you know why they are thriving well in this island? Because they don't have any good predators to feed on them or to harm them. Even there, the harm comes only from human beings. And few natural disasters like volcano, or uh, they also have um, a big uh, tsunami kind of waves and tornadoes, you know, certain um, environmental factors are there, but large, by and large, they are protected over there because um, the land does not have too many predators to prey on them. So now, what are lorises? Now we have all seen lemurs, we are aware of lemurs, we have seen King Julian. Now what are lorises? What are they? Let me tell you. In India, we have, not in only in India, in the world, we have two kinds of lorises. One is the slow lorises. You can see the slow lorises on the left. They are really large teddy bear shaped and they're very cute, very chubby, chubby, uh, cuddly, cuddly organisms or animals. And then you have the thin, slow, uh, thin slender lorises. The slender lorises are called slender because they're very thin and uh, they look very malnourished, but apparently they're not. Um, how many species of slow lorises are there? There are nine species of slow lorises. There are lots and lots of species of slow lorises. They range from two kilos which is large, you know, which is as big as your, uh, your full arm, you can cuddle it, to very small 85 grams, the Javan slow loris. So you have varied sizes and you can see that they have different colorations of bodies and all. But then slender lorises, there are only two species of slender loris. You have the gray slender loris and then you have the red slender loris. You have only two species, but these species are further divided. So first, let me tell you where all the slow lorises are found. The slow lorises have a very large home range. That means uh, they have a very large distribution. That means they are found all across Southeast Asia and Central uh, South Asia. So, the, and in India, they're there in the Northeast, in the Northeast, Arunachal Pradesh, um, in the Himalayan region, you know, that's where you find the slow lorises. But, in South, South India, you have the slender lorises. Now the slender lorises are there only in Sri Lanka and India. The red slender loris are not found in India. They are endemic to Sri Lanka and they're found in small patches in Sri Lanka. And that's it, they're not found anywhere else in the world. But the gray slender loris that is, uh, are found in South India. They're spread all across South India, as you can see in the map, and in few parts of Sri Lanka. Okay, now what is the main difference between the slow loris and the slender loris? The slow loris you can say are hand sized. They are huge. You can hold them, you can cuddle with them. The slender loris are palm sized. You can hold it in your palm. They are that small. The slow loris have a very small tail. Slender lorises do not have tails. Now, why are tails very important? 
the tails will help in the balancing of the body the tails help in jumping and that is very important for monkeys but slender lorises do not have tail wal illa the kurangu it is very strange because whenever we associate a monkey or a primate we always think of the tail but it is so unusual to see a monkey without monkey or a prosimian or a primate without tail so slender lorises do not have a tail and hence they cannot jump they just anatomically incapable of jumping the and the slow lorises are the only venomous primate on this earth they can bite you and they will inject venom where do they get the venom from is it there in the teeth like in the snakes uh not exactly the venom is produced by the combination of two um secretions one is in the branchial gland which is under their arm okay and that secretion when mixed with the saliva come brings up a very strong venom now the venom gives you a nasty bite and sometimes it gives you an anaphylactic shock so out of shock you can die small babies can easily die with a slow loris bite but slender lorises they do bite they do bite and they have a very nasty bite the bites they can bite through your bone they have a very thing stingy bite but they don't have venom they are not venomous creatures they do not have venom in their in them whatsoever um the slow lorises can give you a lethal bite lethal bite is sometimes you can die that's what you mean by lethal bite and slender lorises they will bite but they will not kill you the bites was not going to kill you it can give you infections due to other bacteria and fungus that is available in in the air which will infect the bite but it will not kill you there's no venom there the slow lorises are mostly vegetarian they eat uh, the sap of the tree they eat a large amount of gum they eat new plants new berries and they also eat a lot of insects but slender lorises majorly rely on insects without insects they will not be able to survive they eat a little bit of the gum of the tree or sometimes they have seen to eat flowers but the flowers we have we still cannot see you know what exactly they eat because it's very dark and it's very small so in my following slides you'll understand how difficult it is to study the animal so uh, wherever the fruits are there they, it has to be loaded with a lot of insects and that is what they prefer to eat they eat up the the fruit which has a lot of insects in it uh so or they do eat gum from time to time but mostly by and large they need insects they are insectivores okay now there are two species of slender lorises they are further divided into six subspecies now all these slender lorises might look very similar to you and you don't have to worry about the differences because we have only these two in india we have only two subspecies of gray slender loris in india both the subspecies that are in india are gray slender loris one is the mysore slender loris which is on the top loris lidicarianus lidicarianus and the other one is the malabar slender loris okay so now let us let me show you see in the photographs all the slender lorises look alike now let, this is the reality these are the red slender loris okay these are the red slender loris and these are the four gray slender loris now how can you know, from the photograph are you able to differentiate between them let me just show you once once more are you able to differentiate between them no no you can't differentiate between them it's very difficult to differentiate between the lorises genetic work has not not uh, genetic work has been done in sri lanka but not in india so um the only way you can differentiate between the subspecies of the lorises is through this slide you will need you will need to see the patch the patch that is around the eye so now you need to check whether the patch is diamond shaped or a teardrop shaped or round or circum a semicircle so that you need to find out what 
color this patch is, how dark it is, and what is the shape of the patch. And then you need to see around that patch, you know, in the edges of the patch, what color is there, the patch at the bottom of the patch, and then in the center, right from the nose, you find one line going up. So that, you know, the color of that patch, the difference between all that patch. So when you look at all these characteristics, you will be able to differentiate between the subspecies. Now in India, it is simple because you have only two, only two subspecies are there. So to differentiate these two subspecies, can you see one, the Mysos landolaris, you see this patch, it is like a teardrop. It's like a drop of water or a drop. See, it is oval, okay? It is oval in shape. But in Malabarekis, it is round, like a semicircle. The skin color sometimes varies because based on where they are, sometimes the skin is more reddish or more gray. But in general, the Malabar slendoloris will have a reddish coat. Though they are gray slendoloris, they still sometimes have a reddish coat. And the Mysos slendoloris are completely gray. But in some places, they also will have gray coat. Both of them will have gray coat. So the only way you can differentiate between these two are the shape around the eye. Now, why is it important? Why is it important to make sure that you know what subspecies you're working with? It is very important because both the subspecies do not live in the same habitat. If you interchange the subspecies and put them in, in, in like for Malabar slendoloris, you put them in Mysos slendoloris habitat, they will die. The same goes vice versa. They cannot survive in each other's habitat. Okay. So that is why it is very important to make sure that you know which species, subspecies you're working on. Okay. So now after all this load of information that I have given you, let me tell you about how my journey on the lorises began. Now this story is important because it can inspire many of you into walking on the path that you select. Way back in 2011, when I was working at IASC, I was part of uh, this rescue and rehabilitation group. And I used to be uh, rehabilitating squirrels. Baby squirrels used to come to me and I used to rehabilitate them and then release them back into the wild. Now, during this process, we rescued two slender lorises. Now, the slender loris, if you can see it, I'm holding it in my hand. It is so small. So initially, we thought that uh, this is a baby. So we gave it some milk. It did not take milk. Then we gave it banana because we thought, okay, let's give it banana. And then it was struggling. It ate a little banana, but it was not very happy with it. And then one cockroach flew past it. It caught the cockroach and started eating. And we're like, is it an adult? So we, uh, we went online and that time we were not, I was not a scientist or I was not a researcher. So I looked online and I couldn't find much information about the lorises. I'm like, what is this animal? Why there's absolutely no information about this animal? Then I spoke to Professor Meva Singh from Mysore Zoo, uh, from Mysore uh, University. And uh, he told me that, uh, yes, it is one of the least known primates on earth. And I was very curious to understand, okay, so how do they live? Where do they live? How do they breed? How do they talk to each other. Uh, I want to observe them in the wild. So I went into the forest out of curiosity. Curiosity was the single most driving force for me to walk into the Western Ghats to study Malabar slendoloris, which at that time was the least known primate, one of the least known primate in the world. Nobody knew any information from the wild at that point. They only knew, only distribution work was done. So where all they're present in, in the Western Ghats, that's, that's all work had been done. So curiosity led me into the forest and I fell in love with the lotuses ever since. And uh, I've, I'm still working on them. Uh, the start was not easy. It was not like I walked into the forest and the lorises were there with open arms to welcome me into the forest. No, the start was very, very, very difficult. The first step that I had to get used to was this, complete darkness. I have never lived in a rural setup. So 
even when the current goes a little bit of light can be there you can at least see your hand but in the forest in the forest of western ghats i had to get used to complete darkness absolutely no light i couldn't see my hand i had to get used to that it is scary because you're standing in the middle of the forest and there's no light second i had to get used to this light very low illuminated red light if you can see it does not it is very low illumination this is just for us to see what is on the path okay okay so my story it was not easy because i went i searched i for the first time i went into the forest uh i realized that we have to walk into the forest in the night now these forests have elephants tigers uh, leopards um and snakes and many of the animals that are very dangerous so we had to walk inside this forest with very little light that to red light which is just enough for us to see what is happening what is in the front of us and to spot the lorises so we looked and looked and looked and looked for many days and i could not find even one loris so one night after i we did a survey for a very long time i was very tired i sat down under a tree and i told my tracker you just go around finding a loris if you find one just show me so he uh, he was searching and suddenly he started screaming he's like madam 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 look up look up i'm like what he's like look up look up i look up and one loris was you know staring down at me he's like hi and i'm like wow so that was my first sighting i was sitting under a lor under the same tree with the loris on it for more than 4 hours and i did not know there was loris on above me they are they do not make noises like the other monkeys so you it's very difficult to detect them you will you can actually sit under them or you the lorises can be in your garden and you will not know they were there they are very quiet quiet they are elusive and uh, and they do not disturb anyone so it is very difficult to know that they are there yes they do have vocalizations they do make noises but these noises are very similar to other insect noises cricket noises so you won't even make out that it's a loris unless and until you know what noise to look for or what sound to look for now how do you detect a loris or how does a loris detect you how do, so firstly when in the daytime um, you we have the sensory system so in the daytime the first way to detect would be through the eyes but in the night time there is no light even for the lorises they don't have light so the first way they was they are going to detect you is through sound you know all the sound that you make so because if because they are able to detect you with the sound they will immediately hide themselves so it is very difficult next is smell after they hear your sound they will smell you and only after that they are going to be looking for you and see you okay so habituating a loris is very difficult you can habituate habituation means you get an animal used to you like a dog first time you buy a puppy it will you'll take time to make friends with the puppy just like that to make friends with uh, wild animals is very difficult and lorises are even more difficult because you they will not even get to detect them in the wild it's very very difficult to spot them you have to follow very uh, ethical steps you have to follow the methodology that uh, we experts have described only then you will be able to spot them easily in the wild okay so this is where my uh, story began where uh, i saw the my first loris and i fell in love with the loris and ever since then i have been studying the loris after all this where you do not make noise where you um, you have to wear clothes that does not emit smell no perfumes no cosmetics after after all taking all the precautions after following all the rules this is how much you can see of a loris the bright red eyes so let me show you this is how you can spot a loris can you see a loris can you see this eyes this eyes over there that's a loris and this is on a very good day this is a very good spotting 
and this is how much you can see of a loris. When you spot a loris, this is how much you can see. This is it. This is on a very good day. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so that ends my story and let's talk about the Indian slender lorises. In India, like I told you, we have two subspecies. One is the Malabar slender loris, which is the redder one. And the other one is the Mysore slender loris, the gray one. Now, the Malabar slender loris is found only on the Western Ghats. They are found in the rainforests of the Western Ghats. They are not found just in the forest. They are found outside forests also, in plantations, near the houses and everywhere. But they like to be only in the Western Ghats. Whereas the Mysore slender loris are found across the southern peninsula. They are there in Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Andhra, Telangana, and we are um, Maharashtra, and we are also suspecting few parts of Orissa. But, um, so these two places. So this is the reason you have to know the difference between the subspecies because you cannot interchange their boundaries. They are not, they, they normally do not overlap and you can't put the Mysore slender loris in the Malabar slender loris place or the Malabar slender loris in the Mysore slender loris place because they will die. So it is very essential to know the difference between the subspecies. Okay, where do they live? What kind of habitat do they like? Firstly, you need to know that lorises cannot jump. They are anatomically incapable of jumping. Also, they do not have a tail. Okay, so that would mean that the lorises need to hold, hold and, and climb from one tree to another tree. So the basic thing that you require is contiguity. The, each tree should be touching each other. If you see this, uh, this forest at the end, the, at the corner, you see that all the trees are touching each other. Somehow they should be. So either with, um, they, they, uh, they, they have to be touching either with creepers or bushiness or uh, they, you can put wires. Something has to be there for the trees to be touching each other. Now, if the trees are not touching each other, then the lorises have to, will climb down onto the floor and they will cross the path on the floor. Okay, so for them, for them, they prefer to be on the trees. They do not like to be on the floor. But then if you find many lorises on the floor, that means there is no contiguity in the trees and it is not a suitable or it's not a good habitat for the lorises, okay? They like small amount of human presence, okay? So it is very, um, it is very unusual, right? You normally think all wild animals are deep in the forest, but no, lorises like to be in the edges of the forest. They like to be closer to human beings. They like all the kupatotis in the areas because they get large amount of insects. So they, they prefer to be closer to human habitation. It's just that the people over there will not spot them because they're very very quiet they're very secretive they do not make too many noises or they do not make vocalizations when they are in among human beings they they do not like deep forests so they like forest fringes okay so that is what they like they like lots and lots of insects where all there is lots of insects that is where you find the slender lorises because they love insects and they also prefer darkness. So even when they are in the human area, they prefer to be in the dark areas where you do not have the white lights, you know, white night lights that we all put street lights or house lights. So when it is not too bright, where it's very dark, that is where they prefer to be. And where do they sleep? They sleep, you see this wine, wine tangles, Okay, so these are the areas that the lorises sleep in. So the, all the wine tangles or the branches of the trees will bush up into a nest. So that is where they prefer to sleep. Or they also hold on to uh, branches like this, where all there are no wine tangles. They hold on to branches like this. They curl up into a ball and they go to sleep. So this is how the lorises sleep. And the lorises sleep during daytime and they're very active during nighttime. So they sleep at five o'clock in the morning and they wake up at seven o'clock or six o'clock in the evening. Okay, special morphology. Now let me talk to you about what they look like. 
Okay, so lorises are as small as a squirrel. Can you see the squirrel over here? This is the size the lorises. So imagine a squirrel without a tail. Okay, so that is the size of a loris. They're very tiny. They're very tiny. They're just this small. They have large eyes. They're very sensitive to light. See, one thing you need to understand is for us to be able to see or for any animal or bird or uh, insect to be able to see, we need small amount of light. Even in the night, you need a little amount of light. Now, where do these animals, nocturnal animals get the light from? From the celestial bodies, from the stars, the moon that emit light in the night. That is how they are able to see. Now, that light is very little, right? Compared to the bright light that we use in the daytime, the light that is emitted by the celestial bodies are very little. They're very dim. So what does happen? That is why they have large eyes and they have more cones. They have more glands, you know, extra gland called the tepidium lucidium that will absorb all the light that comes. So the little light that is there, it will absorb it. Okay, so while absorbing all these lights, they do not absorb red color because they lack the glands to absorb red color. And because they do not uh, absorb red, red is reflected back. Okay, so because of which they cannot see red and hence using red light, they are very comfortable. Not only the lorises, all nocturnal animals cannot see red. They're very comfortable in red light. And that is why we use only red light and we cannot use bright light because if you use bright light, it is like hitting one very like uh, hitting torch in your eyes, you know, that irritates your eyes. Sometimes it can blind the lorises because the glands are very sensitive to light. It can blind the lorises. So if you use white light in a loris habitat or white light during your surveys or when you're handling lorises, it can practically blind the animal over time. So it is very detrimental to the animal. Okay, they're tailless, like I already told you. They are limbs are very thin and slender, and hence they are called the slender loris. They cannot jump beyond 0 0.03 meters, which is a very short uh, duration. That is all they can hop. Okay, and uh, they are very small. That the adults are 180 gram to up to 4 480 grams. When in in urban areas the lorises are bigger, and rural areas and in forests the lorises are smaller. The Malabar slender loris is very small, and the uh, Mysis lander lorises are bigger among the two. Fascinating character is males are smaller than females. Now let me show you one more thing. From this slide, can somebody, can, can you tell yourself which is a male and which is a female? Everybody would say that this animal on the left is a female, uh, is a male and this animal is a male. Uh, sorry, vice versa. So everybody would think that the animal without any protrusion is a female and the one with protrusion is a male. Genital protrusion is a male. See, this is what um, we see in the higher animal kingdom. Uh, but these are very primitive animals and hence the females have a protrusion, the males don't. Okay, the females are larger, the females have a protrusion in their genital, system, uh, genital area and the males are smaller and the males do not have a protrusion. Only during breeding time they will have, but it look like a sword, it look like a small white sword. Okay, so this is how you identify a male and a female. Okay, so now I'm going to show you a loris crossing from one tree to another tree. Okay. One tree to another tree. See how they have to hold on and they will let go. So the trees, these are two different trees which has which are connected very closely. So this is how close the trees have to be for the lorises. 
because they're not jumping from one tree to another tree and see how they hold on to the branches. They hold on, they have modified legs, which they'll hold on and move. Okay, so this is how they move from one tree to another tree. All right, okay. Ha, huh, reproduction. Very, um, they have Easter cycle, okay, and which will last only for 24 hours. So it is very essential that during reproductive season, you have to let go of the surveys or any activities. You should not disturb the habitat during the reproductive season because breeding happens only for 24 hours. So the entire season, if you want to ensure that the loris population are increasing, you have to make sure that during that season, there is no disturbances during the night for the lorises. Okay, so they have multiple male, multiple females, and they're solitary. That means they have, or they're normally in a very good habitat where there is no degradation. You'll find only one loris in 100 meters. Okay, they are solitary and they are very territorial. They fight with each other. They are very, uh, they find a lot of territorial fights and you'll find only one loris. And when they have babies, you'll find two lorises. Sometimes you'll find the uh, mothers or the uh, sisters or the daughters of the lorises helping with the mother when the lorises uh, are pregnant or when they're giving birth as midwives. You'll find that in Malabaricus, which is not found in, uh, in, in Malabas land, the loris. So they, um, it's very unusual because the, the, the uh, you can see in the diagram here, the female will be hanging from the branch and the male will climb onto the female to mate with the female. Now this happens only once a year on only one day because the female is in estrus for 24 hours but the entire ritual there is a lot of dances the male will try to uh, woo the female and then other females will come in the male will try to impress the other females or the females will have fights among themselves or more males will have fights among them so there are a lot of rituals that go on for a month before they actually mate so during that entire season, which is two seasons from April to May and July to October, uh, we have to see where uh, like the seasons also change in, uh, in the habitats that you go to. For example, in my uh, area, in my forest, the loris is mated from July to October. And now this is also the time when you have really high uh, rainfall and the entire place gets flooded. So anyway, there is no disturbance from any human beings during during this time and this is the time the lorises choose to mate. Similarly, in other areas where even during rainy season, you're able to go inside, maybe there are different uh, mating uh, season. They might be shorter mating seasons. So it is very essential for us to know when their mating seasons are. And during that time, we should not visit the place. We should just let them be because the they, they do not mate very often. And whenever they mate, it should be successful. This is the only way we can increase their population. Okay. Now, after mating, they do not give rise to many uh, babies. Okay. They have just one or two litter. That is the maximum. I have never come across a loris with two uh, litter in my field, but uh, it is observed in other fields. So in my field, we have, I've only seen one litter. That is one baby. Okay, so now what happens after the loris gives birth to a baby? In the beginning, the baby is like a dot. It's a very small dot. It will be like a dot on the, uh, on, on the uh, abdomen of the loris. Slowly, 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 the babies start growing. And in three months time, they start, uh, the loris will carry the baby up to three months. They carry it on the back or they carry it in the front. They can they carry the lorry, uh, their babies and keep walking around. And after a few months, after a month or two, and within three months, they will start parking the babies because it becomes very heavy for the babies to car be carried, okay? So that time the mother will park the baby. Park the baby in the sense, the baby will be placed in a very safe place and the mother will be just wandering around very close to the baby, not very far from the baby. The mother will be wandering around to uh, look for food. 
okay or insects now uh, when the when the mother wanders around the baby and the mother have a very special call because the mother will make calls to make sure the baby is safe so they keep talking to each other you know they make calls to each other they'll be like calling um, the mother will call the baby the baby will call the mother to make sure that they are maintained distance and that the they are safe from each other uh, safe so they have a special call during that time okay now let me uh, here uh, show you the calls so this is a typical whistle of a slandolorus okay so that's that's a typical whistle it's a high pitch whistle there we go. okay now i told you that the babies have the infants have a special call this is a call So this is the call that the infant uses to call the mother and to interact with the mother. Okay. Now during the copulating, when they are mating, okay, they make a sound that is so distinct from any other sounds. You will not even make out it is a loris. Okay, so if you can see, and then when they are very scared, see, uh, say they get electrocuted, or when they are fighting with each other, uh, they make this growling sound. <laughs> If you have noticed, all four vocalizations are so different from each other. And you have other animals or birds or insects that make very similar sounds. So unless and until you know what you're looking for, it is very difficult to spot a loris. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Now, what do they eat? <laughs> They don't have specific insects that they eat. They eat they eat different kinds of insects because they have a very low metabolic rate and their saliva has a very special enzyme that helps them in digesting even poisonous insects. So many other insects, when many other animals that feed on insects cannot eat poisonous insects. They avoid poisonous insects. Okay, but lorises can feed on poisonous insects also. They can eat insects that are crawling, insects that are flying, insects that are inside the sap of the tree because they have a special finger that helps them um, that helps them pull out insects from inside the sap of the tree. Uh, they, they can eat lizards. They also eat gum that seeps out of the tree. So they have a they can they have a wide range of insects that they can eat. Also makes them a very good. Um, that is one of the very eco uh, good ecological um, importance they have in the forest or in the place that they live because they are very instrumental in controlling insects population. They eat up a large amount of insects. Now they have a lot of behavior that comes with their insect eating. Okay, so number one, what they do is they like to urinate their hands. Okay, so the, when they urine, they they will put the urine on their hand or on their body, and they'll put their hand or, or their leg on the um, the pack of the insects. Like the you can see here, the hand 
this is a human hand but this is just like how this is exactly what the lorus does so the lorus will put the saliva on the hand and then they will keep it on the ants the ants will climb up the hand and then they just lick it up so um, they also like to you smear the poisonous insects so when they catch any insects that is poisonous what they do is they um, they smear urine on it or they'd smear the saliva on the on the insects and then they that will neutralize the toxins and then they eat it up sometime if the, the insects are too toxic they just shake vigorously shake their head so that way also they are able to neutralize the toxic so because they eat a large amount of insects there uh, there is a possibility that their meat is inedible they have lot of toxins in their body and that makes it very difficult for the other animals to eat the lorises or even the human beings to eat the lorises it becomes very highly toxic they also have a low metabolic rate which helps them in digestion of the amount of insects they eat they eat a very large amount of insects okay so when people see a slender loris they assume that lorises are very slow because of this movement it's called cryptic movement cryptic movement is when the lorises go very slow but lorises are actually not very slow they can disappear within seconds they can run very fast and they can disappear within seconds so when they the slow movement is called cryptic movement which is used for ambushing their prey or for protection against possible predators okay so if the prey is there and the loris wants to catch the prey they go very slow to catch the prey using the cryptic movement so and also when human beings are there you see this uh, extra finger this is used for pulling out all the insects from in the box so when the lorises are uh, uh when human beings are there around the lorises the lorises do not want the human beings to see them and hence even that time they will freeze they will freeze and stay in one place for hours together even 5 hours 6 hours or they will move very slowly so and hence making the detectability difficult okay so now what are the threats to lorises natural threats uh, now there are a lot of pre potential predators that are listed potential predators means predators that are uh, potentially feeding on lorises but till date except for the brown palm civet which is over here except for the brown palm civet um, no other animal have been seen to feed on the lorises now we don't know why we do not know why the lorises are the animals do not like eating lorises it could be because their meat is not edible or uh, they have a foul smell we don't know we do not know no studies have been conducted why they do not have potential they do not have predators so they have potential predators so these could be the predators of lorises but we are not very sure okay so uh, but what are the threats to lorises? The um, threats to lorises are us human beings. Only we human being are creating a large amount of threat to the lorises. Now, what are the different threats to the lorises? We have poaching. Uh, we use them in different uh, practices and belief system. We use them as voodoo dolls. We even harm their uh, habitat by uh, bringing uh, by cutting down their habitat. So uh, the first thing that everybody have to know is there are a lot of myths. Myths means beliefs that are not true. So there are a lot of myths that surrounds the lorises. Majority of people, majority among all habitats in Sri Lanka and in India, lorises are believed to be bad omen. If you see a loris, something bad will happen to you. So because of that, what people normally do is they don't want to see a loris. So they go and kill all the lorises so that they don't get to see a loris, even by mystic. They also believe that the eyes of the lorises have a lot of power. So they make a lot of potions and they made a lot of medicines with the eyes of the lorises that are supposed to give you night vision or uh, cure all the ailments in the eyes or even hypnotize other people. The lick of the loris is believed to cure all diseases. Okay. And uh, um, women, if they see a loris, it is believed that she will go barren. That means she will not be able to give birth to any child. These are all myths. A poor loris 
a helpless Loris cannot be doing all these things. These are just beliefs, beliefs that are carried on from generations together because some person many, uh, many, many millions of years ago, some person said this is what the Loris, um, this are the, the Loris is a bad animal. The Loris is creating this, the Loris is creating that. So some person many hundreds of years ago has said that. And then after that, it, uh, the stories have been carried over for many years together, many generations together. But do not believe these myths. These are complete myths. They are only only stories and they are not provable. The lorries do not have any superpowers. What are the other problems? The other problems is accidents. Like I told you, if there is no contiguity or if the trees are not connected to each other on the top, the lorises are forced to come down and to cross the road. Now, the lorises are so tiny that even a cyclist can go over a loris. So this loris has been hit by a cycle. But the cyclist will think it is only a rock because you cannot see a loris. It'll look like a rock on the road. So when the lorises, many lorises are killed because of mere cycle going on it or, um, um, or uh, uh, bikes going on it or any vehicle going on it, many lorises die when they're trying to cross from one tree to another tree, when they get onto the floor. Another thing is it is because the lorises freeze when they are scared, it makes it very easy for poaching. Okay, so many people carry the lorises for many other rituals and the lorises are also uh, sold nationally and internationally for uh, their use in many different rituals. Nobody keeps lorises as pets. Slow lorises are kept as pets because they're very cute, cuddly. Slender lorises are not kept as pets. Slender lorises are majorly used to keep to ward of evil. So there are few people who believe that if you keep lorises at home, all the evil from the home will go away. And hence, they'll simply keep the loris. They will not feed the loris well, and it is well, and they the lorises have a very gruesome um, death. Okay, then the loris have an identity crisis. As so little is known about the loris. See, when you spot a loris in the wild, it is just impossible to find out which loris it is. And even in the uh, Forest Protection Act, the, the schedule, um, lorises come under the schedule one. Under the schedule one, the name given to the loris is loris tardigratus. Now the problem is we do not have any tardigratus in India. Tardigratus are there only in Sri Lanka. So the lorises are highly confused. Another problem with the loris is they look very similar to the lemurs, the bush babies, the potos because of the big eye. Now everybody are aware of the lemurs of Madagascar. So what people will think on rescuing a loris, they will outside India, on rescuing a loris, people will think, oh, it's a lemur and they are shipped off to Madagascar. Or maybe they do not know. So the law, and when they note it down, they note it down as a lemur or a bush baby or a porto. When or a young one of a slow loris, they would think that a slender loris is a young one of a slow loris. So what happens is tracing whether they are being trafficked or not trafficked or what they are trafficked for becomes highly difficult because their identity is not clear. By large, in India and in abroad, their identity is not very clear and hence becomes very difficult to know what to do with a rescued animal. And we also have uh, newbie naturalists. Lorises love to be in gardens and among human population. That's what I said, right? So what happens is when few people spot the loris in the gardens, they will like, oh my God, we need to rescue the loris. So they will take the loris and go deep into the forest and release the loris there. In they, are, they mean well, they're doing a good thing. That's what they think. But problem is that they're rescuing the loris from the loris's house and going and releasing the loris in some other place, which is not their house. So you're releasing the loris in a wrong habitat. So that also kills a loris. So this is a new problem that has emerged and that has to be rectified. So spreading the information or uh, spreading the awareness of loris information is very important. And this is yet another <laughs> problem. Okay. There are two wrong things. This is absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. You must think one person is actually releasing the loris, rescuing and releasing the loris. But no, there is something very, very wrong about this video. I'll tell you. Number one, lorises should not, never be released during daytime. 
because they are very sensitive to light and hence they will not be able to find a good habitat in the morning and the harsh uh, rays of the sun might actually spoil their eyes so it is best and you have to release the lorises only in the night and not during daytime that is number one number two these group of people spotted a loris they did not know what a loris was they thought it is a young one of a bonnet macaque bonnet macaque is the normal uh, korangu that you all see near your houses so they thought it's a young one of a, um, of a bonnet macaque and they wanted to reunite the baby with the macaque now Thankfully, my volunteer was there and he was able to educate them and ask them to leave it back where they spotted the loris. But if, what if the loris is given to a macaque? The macaque will just kill the loris. So it's very important to tell us, uh, educate the people, you know, it is very important to spread awareness of the presence of an animal called loris, which is called Tevangu in Tamil and Kutti Tevangu in Malayalam, Kadu Papa in uh, Kannada, and uh, uh, many other names are given to the lorises as described yesterday by Kumara sir. Um, now it is very important to educate people that yes, there are lorises, there are nocturnal and they are not the small ones of uh, monkeys and, um, and releasing them in, in the appropriate habitat in, in the night is very important. What are the other problems of uh, that the lorises face? Okay, so now this these are the images of slow lorises because we do not have images of slender lorises in in trade. I use the lor slow loris uh, images to just give you an idea of what happens. So you have a new thing that is called photo photo prop. You know, people love to take photographs with these elusive animals with elusive lorises. This is very wrong. We should stop that. Tourists should not be allowed to take photographs with lorises or any wild animals. It is very unethical and this should stop. Um, another thing is to avoid the bite of the lorises. The, the traders will clip off the loris with just a nail cutter, to clip off the teeth of the loris with nail cutter. This is to uh, for easy handling of the lorises because the loris have a very bad bite. And the lorises are tra traded internationally. They're sold. They a lot of rituals are done. Their body parts are taken to make medicines. Okay, so a lot of bad things are happening to the lorises. Now, what can the ambassadors do? Now comes the main important question. What can the ambassadors do? First of all, stop believing myths. There is enough information about the lorises. I have posted many videos about the lorises, scientific information, normal information, baseline information, easy information, different kinds of information are, are, are available on the lorises. Educate yourself, educate yourself with proper information and do not believe any of the myths that come around with lorises. They are not magical creatures. They do not take away bad omen and they should not be exploited for any reason. Two, you need to spread awareness. Spreading awareness does not mean that you go around telling, listen, there is Loris here, let us go and do surveys. No, that's not what you should do. First of all, you should tell people, see, it is, this is a Thevang. And you need to tell them not to believe in the myths. Tell them, nothing, it will not do anything wrong. Do not harm the lorises and educate them. Educate them into telling them that these lorises have survived millions of years. They have survived climate change. They have survived uh, overpopulation. And we should not be the reason to why the, they become extinct. They do not have many um, threats in the wild, but we are the threats. Mm -hmm. So because of us, an animal should not become extinct. That is very important. And hence, you need to spread the awareness. Spread the awareness about being nice to the loris. To stop believing with the lor that the lorises are bad. To also stop using tevanga as a bad word. It's not a bad word. It's a name of an animal. Tevanga is not a curse word. First of all, we need to believe and stop using it as a bad word. You have to change the belief system of people. Start making it sound good. Tell them good stories about lorises. Now you can use all your skills. Now if for your awareness, you don't have to go into the forest and do research and come out and talk. 
No, that's not required. You can spread awareness in your own sweet way. I had one uh, boy from 11th standard. He is 11th standard. He came to me and he's like, Akka, I want to uh, help uh, conserve the lorises. How can I conserve? So I asked him, what do you want to do? You can't come into the forest with me. You're too young and you have school. You can't come to the forest with me. Now, what can you do? He was like, Akka, I can't talk like you. I can't draw. I can't paint. I can't tell stories to people. But what I can do is I'm very good with making videos. I love making videos. I love working on computer. If you help me make a video, I'll make a video. I was like, okay, so let's you make a video and I will use it for spreading awareness about lorises. So he, in his capacity, helped me make a video. I will show you the video after this slide. Similarly, many people come up to me in their own capacity. For example, there is a computer guy. He said, I can't come into the forest, but then I have computer skills and I can help make a website for you. Or there's another person who said, I can do a cartoon for you. There's a cartoonist. As I kept talking, he made cartoons. So all the cartoons that were shown in the slides, he made it for me. So you can do lots of things. You use all your, maybe through music, you can try conserving the lorises. There are lots of things that you can do. Use your talents and figure out how you can use your own talent to conserve the lorises. And if you have any talents, get across to the experts. You can get across to the zoo, Shankari ma'am. You can go to Shankari ma'am or Shankari ma'am can put you across to me. We can sit and figure out how you can use your own talents, your own space, uh, to bring about conserving lorises. Okay, three, do not conduct unnecessary slender loris surveys. Please stop that. Just because you know that one place has lorises, do not start conducting surveys. Surveys are not are important, but they have to be conducted in a very scientific manner only once or twice a year. And we have, we as scientists, we have to take approval of the forest department, of the ethical committee, and um, our superiors. We have to make sure that our methodology is correct. And after we conduct surveys, we have to submit our results. So we also undergo a very strict screening process. So doing random surveys is only going to uh, disturb the habitat. You will not only be disturbing lorises in the habitat, you'll be disturbing the plants and insects and all the other biodiversity in the habitat. You will be destroying the habitat and you'll also be making way for poachers to come and find out that there are animals that can be poached, easily poached. If, it is if the place is accessible to you, it will be accessible to poachers as well. So do not conduct unnecessary slender loris surveys. It is not required. If you think there are lorises there, you have to intimate the superiors. You have to intimate the experts. We will take the necessary action. But if you have questions, if you want to do a loris survey or not a loris survey alone, but if you have any questions or you want to do work on slender lorises in the wild, the first thing you have to have is a very strong question. I want to know if lorises are there in this place or not. That's not a strong question. So what if lorises are there? So what if lorises are not there? How are you, by you finding out if lorises are there or not, is not going to solve or conserve the lorises. You have to have a very strong research question. By finding out if lorises are here, these are the things I will do to ensure that the lorises are protected in its habitat. They have to be a very strong research question if you want to conduct research, okay? So that question has to be communicated to your authorities, maybe uh, the zoo authorities or the experts, or uh, you'll have naturalist experts, many experts are there. You have to tell them your research question. They will help you to reason the question. Is your question correct? Or is your question wrong? Or has your question already been answered? There are a lot of research that's already done. So if uh, if you want to find out an answer to your question, you might you need not go into the forest. You can find it online by reading research papers. Or if you want to see a loris up close, you don't need to go to the wild. There are a lot of videos that are available. You can sit and watch them at home. So seeing a loris in the wild, you need to have a very strong research question. And this research question has to be cross-referenced with your superiors and experts in the field. 
then with the help of the experts, if your research question is really good and very required for the conservation of lorises, then the experts will help you come up with the methodology, the scientifically and ethically approved methodology. And using that methodology only, you have to collect data. After collecting data, you need to analyze it and give it back as a report. And of course, you can publish it as papers if it is good enough. But all this has to be done under the care of an expert. Or else you might land up destroying the habitat of a loris, not only a loris, of other animals. And it is also not safe to be going out there. It's the insects that the loris eat are all, many of them are toxic and they can give you bites that can give you a lot of infections. Even I have got a lot of infections from the insect bites. So the lorises don't, did not bite me, but the insects bit me and I had landed up in hospitals many times because of the allergic reactions that came. So it is not good to be disturbing any animal in the environment, okay? And their environment, it's very wrong to do that. But it's not, if you have a really good question, you can contact, or if you want, to desperately go and see them in the wild then also you contact the experts who are working on the animals in the wild and they will let you know whether you can go with them to collect data or not okay on your own it is very wrong to be going into the forest or going into loris habitat to conduct surveys or to do your scientific research you do need expert advice okay so next this is the video that the 11 standard boy made for me. Slender lorises are one of the least known primates of the world. They are very small nocturnal primates, so small that they can fit in the palm of your hand. These primates are found only in India and Sri Lanka. They are among the first primates to live on earth and they evolved long before the humans or any other monkeys that are alive now. They are awake only at night and largely feed on insects. During the day, they sleep curled up into a ball. I find them very cute with their tiny bodies and large innocent eyes. But now they are facing imminent danger from us human beings. Slender lorises are associated with extreme bad omen all across its habitats in India. Every tribe and community has their own beliefs about these helpless creatures. They are evil. They bring us bad luck. The poor little creatures are often used in black magic rituals where they are pierced and their body parts are broken and burned while they are still alive. Lorises are being trafficked within India and across international borders. While being trafficked, they are often hidden in undergarments and other everyday clothing because of their unassuming size. They freeze when threatened, making it easy for transportation. Not much is known about why they are being trafficked or what they cost in the market. It has also been understood that a few tribals carry them around in wooden boxes for their fortune telling trade. In this project, we want to change the perspectives of the people. We want to go to the root of the problem and bring in changes right from the start. We want to help them understand that these primitive primates are not evil and are not different from other animals that are sacred in their eyes. The lorises need us to protect them. They have survived millions of years of climate change and ecological changes. They should not become extinct because of the human race and their ill beliefs. Okay, so I would like to stop uh, 
my talk here and take questions now. Thank you, Smita ma'am. It was really a wonderful session, and uh, no, we feel like we just walk with you with the with you in the forest, and uh, you know, like hearing the calls of slender lorries and uh, uh, spotting it. You know, it is it is like one of the thrillers ride. Uh, trial that we go with you in the forest it was so nice ma'am thank you so much ma'am for it and the participants like if you have a questions please post it in the youtube chat box uh, we have uh, one question uh, got from ranjit kumar uh, he want to know how the population of slender lotus is estimated in what basis and how do they uh, do the survey okay so um slender lotus is a very difficult to spot like i told you it's just the eyes that's visible and that too uh, when you have to do a lot before going into the forest like make sure that you are not smelly make sure um, that you make no sound and uh, you have to use little low illumination red light and spotting them you can't spot all the lorises the loris has to be seeing you when you are seeing the loris so probability is very low and when the loris knows you're coming they hide so population estimates of lorises has not been successful ever in the 30 years of loris research no one has able to do population estimate but what we do is we find out relative density relative density is from one habitat to another habitat how many lorises could be there so when i walk in one habitat when i conduct a survey in one habitat say i find five lorises in one habitat another habitat i might find seven lorises another habitat i might find one loris so those are relative density estimates so maybe it's also a maybe okay maybe there are more lorises in one habitat in that other habitat there are less lorises so then i find out the difference in what is lacking in the habitats then i study both the habitats to find out which is better for the loris which is less better less for the loris why and all so population density estimates not possible there's nothing that we have devised but we have indirect ways of studying their habitats and relative densities have been done by kumara sir thank you ma'am and the next question like uh, they want to know what is the lifespan of lorises yes so this is a very interesting question that many people have asked me and i am asking the lorises myself uh, in the wild no one has ever estimated the lifespan so a lifespan of a loris in the wild is unknown nobody knows but in duke uh, lima center they have uh, had a loris for 14 years that is the longest the loris has lived in 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 captivity but you also have to understand in captivity you have amazing food you have medical help and and your lifespan generally grows in captivity sometime it might not grow in captivity so we do not know in the wild how long a loris lives because nobody has studied a single loris for so many years so we don't know Thank you, ma'am. And the next question is like, do lorises have any favor for trees? Like, uh, for example, acacia. Uh, lorises are yes. highly found in acacia trees. There is any? Uh, uh, no, they don't have preference for any trees. Any tree species is fine. What they like is connectivity and bushiness. Okay, so they live among five to ten meters. in that 5 to 10 meters if there are a lot of bushes the bushes can you can find and they have very small hands so they like to hold where you saw the video where they were holding so they need such branches acacia has uh, the those tiny branches and they are thorny but if many habitats like in plantations and all you don't have acacia over there so you do find lorises there that's basically because there are a lot of creepers creepers also give it uh, the environment for it to hold and climb and the connectivity because creepers just grow all over and they grow on all the trees so creepers is one of the way you can use but if there are habitats where you find lot of lorises and you find lorises on the floor then probably you can just tie up or connect all the trees with lot of twines twines or ropes that uh, help the loris move and grow creepers on these uh trees so there is no specific tree lorises can live anywhere because they don't eat trees they eat insects <laughs> so they need insects they need connectivity if you can provide that uh, environment for them that's a very good thing to do 
and the next question is from Mohammad Harif. Uh, he has a question. I think it's based on standard loris. What does loris use the venom present in its gland? Uh, slow lorises. Slow lorises have venom in their gland. They use it for fighting with each other. That is a recent study that Anna Nicaris has provided for territorial uh, fighting. They also use it for catching their prey. Okay, but the exact use of uh, why, what else they need the venom for is unknown. So, because it is very difficult to study, even slow lorises are very difficult to spot. Although they are so huge, it's very difficult to spot them. So, unlike snakes or uh, insects, the venom usage of uh, lorises are not widely studied and they're trying to study now. Uh, but it's still unknown. We do know that they inject venom with, into each other when they have territorial fights because the venom causes the decaying of flesh. The flesh decays in that region. So we have seen many slow lorises uh, whose flesh is decaying. So in territorial fights, they use venom that we know. Apart from that, uh, we're still finding out. I mean, the scientists, Anna Nicaris and her group is still finding out what are the uses of the venom. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, that's what the question we got. And uh, uh, thank you so much, Smita, ma'am, for joining us. Uh, now, I request our deputy director, Naga Satish Kidujal IFS, uh, uh, to present the key address for this event and present vote of thanks. Uh, good morning, madam. Good morning, uh, Shankari. It's been a, a wonderful session. Uh, I've been uh, watching the session. You have taken us to many places, you know especially your experience, especially in the forest, you know, the night exploration and the, uh, finding these slow lorises is uh, really amazing. I mean, it meets a lot of interest, a lot of curiosity, which we're talking about, you know, to go ahead and uh, such uh, exploration. Uh, and uh, uh, I thank you very much, madam, for this uh, wonderful session, wherein you went into various aspects, like the breeding aspect, the reproduction, uh, the food, food habits, uh, and uh, their stay, and the way uh, you have you have shown us a lot of uh, interesting videos, interesting uh, uh, calls of these animals. You know, these are very uh, uh, very difficult animals. You know, to study actually. Uh, we generally have this interest of uh, showing interest on big big cats, you know, tigers, lions, etc. But uh, there are some species which uh, somehow we uh, very rarely show interest to make uh, you know, deeper studies. Uh, this session has uh, indeed given a lot of inputs even uh, to us, the management of the zoo, uh, wherein we, we understand, you know, more deeper the species which we are dealing with. So I thank you very much for uh, uh, sparing your time and coming here and uh, telling to all our audience. And uh, I thank Shankari also for uh, you know inviting and you know, finding and inviting such amazing guests for our talks. Uh, uh, I also hope that you know many of the students and uh, the audience you know they start joining us as uh, species ambassadors and uh, uh, make this species popular among the uh, masses and. Uh, try to uh, uh, we all try to join our hands to protect the species. The numbers, as we know, it's it's very difficult to know the exact numbers also as of now. Uh, so, uh, but the points which you have told, like the habitat destruction, uh, you know, the these being used as good dolls and uh, considered as bad omen. So these are very critical uh, uh, aspects. Uh, we hope that we all join our hands together to ensure that uh, the species of uh, slender loris uh, you know progresses uh, thank you very much ma'am for joining and uh, thank all uh, I, I also want to thank uh, kumara sir yesterday he had also given a very nice uh, uh, introduction and uh, knowledge about the slender loris this is a very good initiative wherein uh, we are trying to bring out uh, the interesting facts of uh, lesser known species. So uh, I, I thank a lot for joining us and uh, making this session such an interesting and interactive one. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was indeed my pleasure and I would like to be associated with the Aranya Zoo sure. uh, for future programs. And uh, please get back to me with any assistance that you need or... Uh, when we invite you to our zoo also, whenever you free, find time, whenever you are in, around in Chennai, kindly do drop in and uh, we would be uh, uh, very happy to host you. Thank you, sir. That will be my big pleasure. <laughs>
thank you thank you uh, sir thank you sir thank you sudeesh sir and uh, i conclude the session uh, with a lot of thanks to smita ma'am once again and uh, with a very short notice uh, you have accepted this offer and you came to you came up with a very wonderful presentation ma'am thank you so much and i also take the grateful to thank our kumara sir and smita ma'am for joining this session and uh, making the zoom uh, species ambassador session a great success with your uh, knowledge sharing and yes so thank you sir and i uh, i am so grateful and take privilege to thank our director sir devasis jana ifs our deputy director nagasudesh gilijala ifs sir for keep supporting and motivating and uh, running us throughout this program and our entire aaz aaz team too so thank you so much ma'am and uh, for zoo ambassadors uh, zoo ambassador this is the next level of program that we are organizing with the species ambassador program so you will be titled as a species ambassador of slender norris after completing the session we have posted a form in this uh, youtube chat please uh, fill up the forms once you fill up the form only we can able to pro provide you the e certificate the titling you as a species ambassador of slender norris and after this, you have to conduct awareness session to known circle i think smita ma'am has explained you in detail what you have to do as an ambassador and what you are not supposed to do so we will be here to support you to guide you throughout this uh, throughout your awareness session if you have any queries you can email to us uh, it's aazpsuschool@gmail.com and uh, we will be available for you to assist you at any point of time so i thank all the participants and audience who have joined today's session so thank you all and thank you once again to the zoom management and to our eminent speakers of the session so thank you so much thank you thank you